Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Millennial in the Middle. I'm Connor DeLynn. This is our third episode in a week. Uh, that breaks a Millennial in the Middle record. Here I come back on Wednesday and then I say we're going to do some reactionary episodes as needed. And this is now the second time this week that something has happened in our country that I've felt compelled to talk about. And uh, I'd like to walk you through kind of my thoughts over the last... 24 hours. Uh, first off, it's Saturday morning right now when I am recording this. And Friday night, I was kind of away from my phone. I wasn't too in touch with you know the news or what was going on. And I came back after being out and had all sorts of texts, right? If you've seen what happened with Donald Trump being shut off Twitter, his accounts are blocked. He's been banned permanently from Facebook, Instagram. And I start looking into this and immediately I had this emotional reaction. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I was fired up. I was ticked off. I put something up on social that at the end of the day, this isn't right. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about maybe doing an episode on this. What are your thoughts? And I think we broke another record of the most direct messages the Millennial in the Middle Instagram account has ever received. Uh, as you basically very quickly told me, yes. Please talk about this. We need to discuss it. And so honestly, I was going to record an episode last night. It was like midnight and I was about ready to pull out the microphone and just roll with it and do it. But I realized that I was in a little bit of an emotional state. Uh, I was a little fired up. And you know that here on this podcast, I try very, very hard. I make a very conscious effort to stay rational, to be fair, to be balanced, and to look at things from a perspective that you know often we don't get when we just look at social media or we watch the news that is so entertainment based and i think a lot of you that's why you listen to the podcast and that's why you enjoy it so i'm like no i'm not going to record a podcast in an emotional state i'm going to sleep on this let's record tomorrow morning we'll see how we're feeling then and i'm really glad i did that because what's happened now over the last 12 hours is I've been able to think about this a little bit more. I think some of my thoughts of why I had that emotional reaction to that news yesterday started to sink in, started to make sense a little bit more to me. And I hope to communicate and explain that to you today in a way that helps you as you are kind of developing your own thoughts on social media and censorship and free speech and hate speech and inciting violence, all these things that we're hearing right now, I'm gonna tell you where I land on this. Now, with that said, what I'm about to talk about today has nothing to do with Donald Trump. And I know that may seem really difficult to believe. Yes, Donald Trump's accounts being shut down and others that we'll talk about in a bit definitely was the last straw that broke the camel's back, I think, for a lot of people. But this isn't about Donald Trump. This is about a principle and this is about a precedent that we're setting. And I think it's important. This is a very good example of a situation that this is not red or blue. This is not a topic to look at when it comes to social media censorship and free speech to, oh, well, I'm a conservative, so I should feel this way, or I'm a liberal, so I should feel this way. It has nothing to do with that. If you are a liberal and you hate Donald Trump, and yesterday you had a little bit of a celebration, like, yeah, we kicked that guy off Twitter. This is awesome. Donald Trump, you are the worst. And we just took away your microphone that put you into power. That's not what this argument is about. And I would warn you a little bit of caution if that's the way you look at this right now of like, well, I don't like Donald Trump, so this is a good thing that we've done this. That's a mistake because there's something much, much bigger to be discussed and talked about here. Um, and so on the other side of things, like as a conservative, this isn't about making sure Donald Trump is able to speak to his followers. That might be something that comes into play throughout this, but this is not an isolated event. This is about principle and my feelings on this do not have anything to do with Donald Trump. Trust me, if you've listened to the podcast over the last few months, I have been very irritated and very disappointed in Donald Trump since election night. 
And to be honest, you know, I've said to a lot of people, Donald Trump proved to be a sore winner. So are we really all that surprised that he's also a sore loser? No. You know, as I look at what's happened over the last, you know, month or two months, heck, what happened at the Capitol on Wednesday? I talked about how to see our nation's capital be, the security be breached and people go and do what they did at the Capitol, like that is an image I hope we never see as a country again. That was unacceptable in so many different ways. But we have to separate this from the real question today of when does the government and when do big organizations who start to control ideas, freedom of speech, the way that we can have dissent and discord and ideas that may be contrary to common belief or public opinion, How do we respond to that? And is it okay for a free society to shut that down? That's what we're going to talk about today. And it really has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Now, as we dive into this, I want to start with a story. You hear me say that all the time. We're going to start with a story. That's how we connect. I have traveled all over the world. We've talked about this. When I used to speak, uh, when I used to speak for a living and I was out on the road, I was out, you know, four or five trips a month. I traveled to 10 different countries, 47 of 50 states. And one of these trips sticks out to me. I actually went out to speak in Vietnam. Uh, I'll tell that story maybe later on, but it was crazy. I spoke to about 500 people, translated into four or five different languages. That was the hardest speaking event I've ever been at because I wasn't able to really connect with the people in a way that I'm used to. Um, But I spoke in Vietnam and I decided on the way home that I wanted to extend my layover in Beijing and go to China for the first time. Why? Because it was on my bucket list to go to the Great Wall of China. Wasn't necessarily on my bucket list to go to China, but I wanted to go to one of those, you know, the wonders of the world. And I went, uh, so basically extend my layover to about two days, about 36, 48 hours that I had in Beijing, and I was by myself. Now, I have traveled all over the place by myself. I'm actually, like, I feel more comfortable in an airport when I'm by myself. I enjoy getting on an airplane, throwing on my noise cancellation headphones, and just being in my own world. I love it. But as I got off the plane in Beijing, it hit me for the first time like, oh, wow, I am an outsider here. I'm the foreigner. And I had been out of the country quite a bit. But in all the times I'd been out of the country, I I felt like people were more so trying to, you know, help me out or they wanted to talk to me because I was an American. And let's face it, I stick out like a sore thumb a lot of times, especially in Asia, like this blonde guy walking around. And typically, I mean, I'll tell you, all my other experiences in Asia, I almost get looked at like I'm a Hollywood celebrity a little bit. Like, oh, look at that hair. I got people wanting to take pictures with your hair. Didn't happen in China. I remember trying to check in at my hotel, which was a nice hotel in a commercialized, uh, like, financial district area of Beijing, and realizing that no one at the front desk spoke a lick of English. And they didn't have any desire to even try to do that. And for the first time, I felt what being in this like closed society was. And it was a little bit of this gut check for me of like, am I in over my head? Should I be in this city alone? And uh, to be honest, it was the first, it's the only time ever really scaring that I, or ever really traveling that I felt a little uncomfortable and an uneasiness. And the first thing I do, I flew to China. I check into my hotel. The first thing up on my kind of list of things I was going to knock out in my just get after it 36 hours to enjoy this city was I was going to go to the Forbidden City. Forbidden City where the emperor of China's you know, home used to be and very cool place. It was incredible. But outside the Forbidden City, where you enter the Forbidden City is Tiananmen Square, which is basically the capital of the Chinese government. And I was walking through Tiananmen Square. And if you've seen pictures of it, or if you've been there, you don't, for me, I felt like I was suddenly in the Hunger Games. Like everything looks different. By the way, it's 
dark. It's kind of humid and muggy. The pollution in Beijing is worse than like any other city that you can't see the sun. Everything's kind of gray. I felt like I was in this communist 80s world, which I was. It's a communist government. I remember seeing the big picture in red of General Mao up on, you know, up on the wall. And all of a sudden having this strange feeling come over me. And because I'm into history and I, you know, I like to learn along the way, what do I do? I'm like, I want to remind myself about the details and the specifics of the protests that happened in Tiananmen Square. I kind of knew the general gist that it was in the 80s and there were protests and the Chinese government brought tanks in and there were a bunch of deaths and not a good moment for China. So what do I do? I pull out my phone and go to Google, like we all do when we want information. Pull out my phone and I type in Tiananmen Square protest and I search it and nothing. I don't get any results. I'm trying to like re give myself a little visit like Wikipedia. Come on, just give me the first paragraph of when exactly was it again? What happened and what were the protests at Tiananmen Square all about? I'm on Google and I cannot find a single mention of this event that I know happened in 1989, about 15 years earlier when I was there. Or sorry, that math's wrong, about 25 years earlier than when I was there. And all of a sudden I realized I'm in China. I'm in a communist, a communist state right now that censors information. And I cannot find this story, I, like they have decided to erase this bit of their history because it doesn't make the communist government of China look very good. And immediately I had this sense come about me of I felt like I was in the most foreign place I had ever been in. Now to contrast that, I love Washington, D.C., if you know me, like, you know, when you listen to the podcast, that probably shouldn't come as much as a surprise. The National Mall, I love the feeling of walking around those monuments, the Lincoln Mo Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, seeing, you know, the way that it's built to where you can see a lot of them from the same bit and walking around the open air. If you've ever been there in the spring, seeing the cherry blossoms bloom in Washington, D.C., and you just feel like this is America, this is freedom, this is democracy. Whatever that feeling is, it was the exact opposite at Tiananmen Square. There were a lot of people taking pictures in front of, you know, the General Mao picture you see on the wall. And I actually had someone ask me because I took a picture for someone else. And then they asked, oh, do you want me to take a picture of you? And I said, no, no, thanks. I'm okay. Because I didn't want a picture in front of it. Now, here's why I say that. We have, most of us listening to the podcast, have been born and raised in a society that respects our democracy, that respects free speech, different opinions, dissent. And we not only allow for that, we encourage that. We know that discourse and public conversation is what allows us to progress as a nation. And I was in this place where I'm like, wow, dissent is not allowed and information is completely controlled. I know I could not live in that sort of environment. And that is the event, that's the memory to me that's been rolling through my mind since kind of, I think we reached our boiling point with social media censorship over the last 24 hours. Now, couple things I want to point out as I jump into this, just to kind of know what happened. Uh, so yesterday, which was Friday, um, Facebook and Instagram basically suspended Donald Trump's accounts. Twitter permanently banned him from the platform. Um, but that wasn't all. There were also like the, uh, the new app Parler, which prides itself as the free speech social media app that doesn't have any censorship that a lot of Republican and right-wing extremists have gone towards, um, has been either threatened to close down or closed down by both Google and Apple in their stores where you download the apps. Twitter suspended the accounts of 
uh, Michael Flynn of attorneys Lynn Wood and Sidney Powell that were in support of the president. Uh, other things like the hashtag, hashtag walk away. Uh, it's a conservative social media campaign with over 500,000 members that simply their platform is they encourage those on the left to walk away from the Democratic Party was purged of almost all of their content yesterday. And Steve Bannon, his YouTube channel had almost all of their videos removed yesterday. So kind of this one fail swoop by social media was like, all right, if we're all going to do this, everyone threw the restrictions on and Donald Trump, the sitting current president of the United States, cannot make a post on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter in the way that you or I can. Now, a couple things I want to point out. First off, I am not I don't have any problem with the fact that Twitter has the ability to suspend someone's account. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, these are private corporations and they are individually owned institutions. They have every right in the world as a business to deny service if rules that they set arbitrarily aren't met. So that's not the argument. I had a few of you reach out to me yesterday and be like, well, Connor, it's their business. If they set rules and they aren't lived by, they can kick whoever they want out. True, 100%. No shoes, no shirt, no service. I have zero problem with that, okay? And frankly, from Twitter's standpoint, I think there's got to be a little personal animosity here, right? Because Twitter is what propelled Donald Trump to the presidency. It's how he gained his following. It's how he owned the news cycle for years. He put a tweet out and what was what was now everyone on all the cable news networks reacting to for the next 24 hours, Donald Trump's most recent tweet. And then the breaking news and headline changed the minute Donald Trump tweeted again. And it was this new sort of immediacy and a closeness to the president and the government that we'd never experienced before. Like Twitter is an amazing tool for that. It is really cool that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Ted Cruz can be sitting in a Senate hearing and can put out a message typed on their phone that in five seconds, everyone in the world can read. And I can read exactly what comes out of Ted Cruz or AOC's mouth right then and there. I believe that is a great thing for democracy. I believe it's a fantastic thing for free thinkers because it takes out the middleman. In the past, we really couldn't hear, you know, prior to radio, there was no hearing exactly what the president said. You would read the newspaper, which would have excerpts from a speech that the president gave. And of course, what comes along with that newspaper article? Opinions, ideas, spin. That's what we've done. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he changed the way that the president spoke to the American people with his fireside chats. Because Americans throughout the country were able to sit in their living room and hear the voice of their president on the radio. Direct channel. Twitter is just an evolution of that same theory, but it's so much faster, it's so much more content. And if I think about it, if I'm the owner of Twitter and I don't like Donald Trump or I'm a liberal or whatever it might be, you might really hate the fact that you know that the platform that you created is what gave Donald Trump the power that he's had over the last four years. And I could see if now it's like, oh man, I'm so done with that guy. I don't want to be tied. This is my last chance. He's got 10 days left in office. We have this capital threat that's taken place, this capital riot and protest. So because of that, I'm going to have the last word. Donald Trump, we don't want your business anymore. I'm okay with that. At the end of the day, like Donald Trump will figure out how to talk to the American people. Okay. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, I had a pretty interesting take from uh, 
a partner that I'm going to talk about a little later. We're actually going to be partnering with uh, a new brand, a new blog called Pot and Kettle Politics. Uh, you've probably seen some of their articles in some of my social stuff, but you'll see a lot more of them. He's going to help with a lot of kind of the research and things that I'm doing on more of these reactionary episodes. But he actually said to me last night, he said, uh, he said, Connor, I, I wonder if they would have shut down Donald Trump's accounts in September if Trump wins the election. And I thought, man, that's so, it's such an interesting thought, such a great take, Austin. Because my thought was, yeah, if all of a sudden, right before election day, the powers that be shut down Donald Trump's account, it's almost that like, well, if we can't have it, then that's exactly what I want. If they're shutting him down, then maybe that guy's on to something. I think it would have backfired, and I think it's probably why they didn't do it. Now, the other point I need to make here is the difference between... There's several different reasons for things being taken off of social media within the community guidelines. Some of it has to do with hate speech, threats, things that are leading to direct violence. And then the other side is this whole argument of trying to protect America from misinformation. From, you know, no doubt, social media allows for fake news to be circulated and to be sent from person to person. And is that a dangerous thing? Sure, right? If a lot of people are believing false information, absolutely. There's a couple problems though inherently with those two pieces. Who decides what is hate speech and what can actually lead to violence? And who decides what is misinformation and what is fake news? Whoever now is making those calls wields a lot of power. And in my opinion, way too much power. Now, it's also really hard to draw the line of where someone, you know, where a tweet is actually a direct cause of like violence right? You look at Trump tweets and yeah, there's some that you definitely could read through the lines and be like, oh yeah, maybe this is going to be violent coming up. When he talks about, we can't be weak. We need to be strong. We need to take it back. This is our time. Like, yeah, that's pretty forceful language. But at the same time, you see a tweet that says, we're about to go to the Capitol. We're about to peacefully and patriotically protest the election being, uh, the election being uh, confirmed. And I sit there and go, well, who, who's making that decision? Well, all the riots that happened this summer. Some of those riots turned violent, but I don't know if I can blame the person that posted on social media about the rally for that. I wouldn't take down that post. Now, if someone says, hey, we're going to go and we're going to kill Nancy Pelosi, yeah, that shouldn't be there. That is, that's where free speech draws that line where we need to be protected. You can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. We know this. But at the same time, if someone on Twitter tweets, I'm about to go and kill a cop, that better be taken down too. And so from this middle perspective, the issue becomes when a lot of this is one-sided. When a lot of this, you know, it's hard to know, well, who really holds the chips here? Who's the one that's controlling this power of information, uh, you know, the power of controlling information? And here's where these problems come. Now, the hate speech, yeah, if it is inciting violence, if it is, uh, you know, it's hard. Again, does this just rile people up to do that? Or are you specifically saying that? It's a line that is extremely hard to draw. And these social media platforms drew it yesterday. To me, where I have the bigger issue is in these social platforms taking, on, taking upon themselves the charge to protect America from misinformation, from harmful information that goes against common belief. 
Facebook said this. Facebook said they removed content and accounts that violated our policies against inciting violence and dangerous organizations in the lead up to January 6th and were continuing to monitor and remove dangerous content. Okay, like I'm all right with that. I can swallow that a little easier. Again, it raises the question, well, remove dangerous content? How do we define dangerous? But this next comment, this is from a Twitter spokesperson. This is the one that really, really scares me. And I think it should scare you too. A Twitter spokeswoman, a person said that they had taken enforcement action on thousands of accounts that were attempting to undermine the public conversation and cause real world harm. What the hell does that mean? undermine the public conversation? That's Twitter's spokesperson saying that yesterday. So to me, what I hear when I hear undermining the public conversation, it's, well, this is how a majority thinks. This is, if you are going to go against common belief or popular opinion, the public conversation, as she said, then that is grounds to have those accounts, those tweets be removed or those accounts be suspended. That is so scary to me because watch how this has happened in 2020. I'm not talking about Donald Trump anymore. I'm not talking about riots. Think whatever you want. COVID-19. We have gone through a year where we have all probably seen a post that maybe we were sent and then you went to click on it and it said, oh, this post was removed because it didn't fit our community guidelines. What are the community guidelines? Who sets those? When I got the most fired up about social media censorship and all of a sudden bells started ringing in my head that this was wrong, was earlier in the summer, if you remember when the YouTube video went out with the two doctors um, from California, the one was Eric Larson, I can't remember the other guy's name, where they did a 45 minute news press conference with newspapers there, uh, reporters asking questions. They did about a 20 minute presentation on their findings, what they had found. And then they gave the reporters a chance to ask questions about a 45 minute interview and it was posted on YouTube. And YouTube took the video down because it went against their community guidelines. And how it violated the community guideline is that the opinions expressed were contrary to, uh, to principles, or excuse me, were contrary to recommendations given by the CDC. I read that and I said, wait, that's what science is. Science is all about experimenting and testing beliefs and we create a hypothesis and then we test it out and we have data and results and then you present what you know. And from what you know, that's what then forms your ideas and beliefs. And guess what? Two doctors can disagree. The CDC is recognized as you know who we are going to listen to as the foremost expert in the world for how to handle COVID-19. But as other information and other doctors and other things come out, to say that it is misinformation because there are parts of it that might be contrary to what these larger organizations are saying, that is not democracy. That is not free speech. That takes away progress like in every bit of, uh, of our lives. I experienced this early on in a personal story. Um, my mom, a few years back, had a real scary time um, with melanoma, with uh, skin cancer. And it was pretty close. It was looking like it was heading to stage four um, and traveling to the bone. It was a scary time for our family. And my mom, credit to her, she's one that she researches everything. When she all of a sudden has something new she wants to learn about, she'll dive in and learn about it. She's way more medically minded than I am or ever will be. And she basically found that four 
melanoma. There is a way that they treat melanoma all throughout Europe that is not supported and approved by the FDA in America. And you cannot receive this treatment in America, but it's given all throughout South America and throughout Europe. And so my mom did some research and actually found that she could go receive this treatment in Mexico in a treatment center called Hope for Cancer in Cancun. And so she goes and has an amazing experience. Now, to give you a bit of an update, my mom's totally healthy now, doing great. Thanks for asking. It's all good there. Whether it was thanks to these treatments or not, I don't know. We don't know. We'll never know, but we're glad to know she's okay. But what was interesting is she had a lot of people asking her, well, what were these treatments? What what were you doing? Tell me about this organization. And so she made a post on social media on her Facebook. This is my mom with a thousand followers, right? Makes a post and posts a picture with the gentleman who uh, started this clinic and was the head researcher and the head doctor that is pretty world renowned for cancer treatment. Um, Dr. Tony Jimenez is his name. I think it's Jimenez. I hope that's right. Dr. Tony, I just know is what my mom calls him. She posted a picture with him and basically explained the different uh, medical treatments that she had. A week later, she had a friend reach out to her and say, Joanne, are you doing okay? Where did that post go? I went to go back and see it and it's not there. It said it had been removed. It had been taken down. And my mom went back and her social post about her experience with her body, treatments that she chose to have, and just simply giving an explanation for what she did had suddenly disappeared from the world of social media. It was removed. What's the play there? Guys, this to me is so, so dangerous. Because ultimately, it's a slippery slope that gets us to the point of uh, when we can't trust that the information that we have, that we're getting the full story, that is a direct threat to our democracy. The New York Times put out an article yesterday. New York Times gave a headline that said, is free speech a threat to our democracy? And I read that headline and I said, man, that's an oxymoron. How does that even make sense? Is free speech a threat to democracy? What are you talking about? Like free speech has to be in place for a healthy democracy. But that is something that we're debating right now. In the post, they went and they took law professors and different legal scholars uh, from different from both sides of the spectrum and kind of gave their thoughts. And I loved what Robert Post said. He is a Yale law professor, and he said this, A functioning democracy requires both that citizens feel free to participate in the formation of public opinion and that they are able to access adequate, accurate information about public matters. Insofar as it protects these values, the First Amendment serves as a crucial tool of self-governance. In the absence of self-governance, government is experienced as compulsion, as being told what to think and what to do, and that is not a desirable situation. I could not agree more with that post right there. There is information that the minute we are feeling like we are being protected from, now self-governance is lost because I'm being told what to think. Now, I'm about to do something here toward the end of this episode that I'm honestly really hesitant to do. I, as a general rule, you know that I am not an extreme guy right? This podcast is millennial in the middle. I am fair. I'm commonsensical. I try to be very rational. I hate hyperbolic arguments. I hate arguments that, you know, try to get you fear a certain idea, a certain belief by giving this really extreme, scary, exaggerated example. And then you're like, oh yeah, because of that, we should do it. It's prevalent on social media. I stay away from it. But I'm about to give you an example here of the slippery slope that we're on that I don't want you taking, having a takeaway that is about to say, you know, a takeaway that's too extreme. Just listen to me straight. I told you I love DC. 
If you ever go to DC and you haven't been there before and you want a list of things to do in a few days, I'll tell you. My favorite museum in all of Washington, DC is the National Holocaust Museum. Here's why. I, as a kid, I, I love World War II. You know this. I love studying about this. I'm intrigued by Hitler and the Holocaust and the war in Europe. It's so interesting. But the question was, how does that happen? It's so hard to wrap your head around the extermination. Like 70 years ago, this isn't that long, the roundup and extermination of millions of Jews. How does a country get to that point? How does that allowed to happen? And what I think is so amazing about the Holocaust Museum is it focuses, like the whole first floor of the Holocaust Museum, is everything that took place in lead up to that time. Here's what started to happen that created an environment that was able to produce such an atrocity. And what happened was the national government sought control of public opinion, ideas were shut down, dissent was not allowed, and it did not take very much time for that to be then seen in individual citizens. My favorite satire of our time, I love satire, political satire, the movie Jojo Rabbit. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's bold. Taiki Waititi, I think that's how you say his name. Um, he's brilliant. And what he did with that movie, because he helps answer that question in a really good way. Like one, how do you make a comedy about the Holocaust and Hitler? He figured out how to do it. He did it through the mindset of this little boy who was raised in Nazi Germany, had been fed propaganda, he's in Hitler youth his entire life, and he's been conditioned and trained to the way to think, and he's never been shown anything that's outside of the reality that he has been given. And he has a, has a conversation early on with his little buddy. The buddy's so cute. It's so funny because he has like an English accent of being German, uh, you know, pretending to be a German, speaking English. But the little boy asks Jojo, he says, Jojo, what would you do if you found a Jew? And he says, well, I'd, I'd kill it. I'd find it and I'd kill it and I'd smash it like a spider. What's so interesting is he uses the word it. What happened in the lead up to the Holocaust is the dehumanization and the otherization that took place where Jews suddenly by a group of people weren't viewed as people. They weren't viewed as humans. That it was what you would describe as a Jew. Not he, him, or her. And then his whole world is rocked when he meets a Jew, a little girl that's his age, that doesn't have horns, that isn't inherently evil. And he has this battle internally. Now, Hitler is his imaginary friend voice inside of his head, everything that he's been taught his entire life. And he now has to figure out how to navigate through this well, here's what reality is, and here's what I'm seeing, but here's what I've been taught, and here's what I've been told. The Germans started by burning books. They controlled information. The book burning that took place in the 1930s, here was the justification for it. The books targeted, so it was the German Student Union that ceremonially burned books, ceremonially, I'm struggling with that word, there you go, burnt books in Nazi Germany and Austria in the 1930s. The books targeted were those viewed as being subversive or as representing ideologies opposed to Nazism. So think about that. Representing ideas that opposed to Nazism, that's what they got rid of. What did that Twitter spokesperson say yesterday? That we are taking down content that undermines the public conversation, that is dangerous for us. Yeah, our president has said things and is continuing to say things right now that are dangerous. And it's not okay. 
Honestly, his Twitter account probably should have, he might have maybe, would have been a lot better president if he would have just stopped tweeting. I'm with you there. It's not okay to rile people up to violence. It's not okay to spread false information all the time if it is, or to continually like spread that. Like, I get that. But I think the precedent of letting a group or a group uh, or groups of people decide what is against the public conversation and we need to close that down, that's the danger in the slippery slope. My mom's post about her experience in Mexico should not have been taken down. Those videos of Dr. Larson talking about his findings in the hospital that he's working at every day in California should not have been taken down because it didn't match the narrative. That's the danger. In closing, I start every episode with the theme song of Millennial in the Middle. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Here I am stuck in the middle with you. I end every episode singing that. And it's funny because that song has become over and over so applicable to so many different conversations that we've had in the course of these 37 episodes or wherever we're at. And this is what hit me again late last night. We have talked about the clowns to the left and the jokers to the right as if it were a bad thing. Those of you that enjoy the podcast, it's because you know like, man, I'm not in the extreme. I find myself somewhere in the middle. And we're like, hey, there's this ground in the middle and that's okay to be there. And we don't have to be a clown to the left or a joker to the right and that extreme. And that's all we hear passionately. But... The fact that we have clowns on the left and jokers to the right is a good thing for America. It's a good thing for the world. And not only is it a good thing, a great thing, it's necessary. We have to have those differing opinions. Because without the differing opinions, without the extremes, you also lose the middle. If there weren't extremes, you couldn't be in the middle of them. Now, I get that I say, you know, being in the middle doesn't mean that you're, you might lean left, you might lean right. That's okay. Maybe you're really right on some topics and really left on others. That's okay. That's a being in the middle. But the problem is this. If the jokers, or in this case, the joker to the right is silenced, eliminated, and not allowed to speak, what do we lose? Well, now we're just stuck with the clowns to the left. And it doesn't take very long when you only hear from one side of things to lose the middle. Because you can't have a middle if there isn't a right and a left. And if you get rid of right, suddenly there's not middle and left anymore. There's just reality. There's the public conversation. There's this is what we believe as a society. We must protect dissent. We will disagree with people all the time, especially when it comes to politics. But I would hope that we fight for people's ability to disagree with us. That's why I love this podcast, because we bring people on with different perspectives, mindsets, backgrounds, ideologies, and we give them a place to speak a lot of times. And I hope that you enjoyed listening to people that are different from you. And maybe you completely disagree with them, but I hope what we can always agree on is our right that we have to disagree with each other. And the minute that is lost... That's when democracy is lost. I'm fired up about this. Uh, I'm really struggling with this. And you know what? There's time where you got to draw a line in the sand. We saw these social platforms do this yesterday. What, what's the takeaway from this? Ultimately, where I struggle more than anything else is seeing certain politicians right now in full support of shutting down and silencing people that don't agree with them. Because this isn't a red or a blue matter. 
This is a matter of protecting free speech, which leads to progress. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. We'll be back. Who knows? Maybe something crap, crazy will happen today, and you'll hear an episode from me tomorrow. It's, it's 2020. You thought we were, or 2021. You thought we were going to get a break. Looks like not. Until next time. Clowns to the left me. Jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Hang in there, guys. Clowns to the left of me. Jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck.